want to do two things. I want to give thanks to the Lord, not for just the things seen, but for the things unseen. And I really need God's help today because um, God used the, what I call the 11th hour on me. You know, I prepared a huge study. I thought I was going to take you all into, bat, into uh, First Peter again. And uh, it turns out that yesterday, at what I call the 11th hour, uh, I think God, you know, God doesn't talk and say, go to the scripture, but you can't avoid it. You, you, you open your Bible and it's there. And then you go away and it's there again. And it's like, <laughs> <laughs> and then finally it's like, okay, I surrender. So um, I'm going to take you to maybe the place that we're supposed to go. I pray so, and that's why I said I need help. Uh, your prayers and uh, open hearts to receive to uh, the book of Deuteronomy. Moses seemingly, uh, in, throughout the book of Deut Deuteronomy, seemingly keeps repeating a concept to remember to remember, to remember. Now, have you uh, open and turn your Bibles to Deuteronomy 8? Um, and while you're doing that, I want to kind of use some strange ideas. You know, memory, as we get older, supposedly our memory uh, slips and fails. That may work to our advantage, and we may not even know it. But... Um, some of you have gotten that. This being the last Sunday of 2010, um, I thought we should kind of look back a little bit on the last year. I am not one for camping out in days past and living in the past. I'm not one for that. In fact, it's been my complaint. Most of Christianity spends their time living in the past and not living for today in Christ. Um, but a little reflection looking back with the instruction from Moses actually blessed my heart because I recognize sometimes we can go through things and not stop and take a moment to really look back and say, wow, the Lord was really with us during these times. Now, 2010 may mark for some. Uh, you may look back at the close of this year, which is just a few days away, and remember, a day and a month, a child was born in, into your family or to one of your closest friends. Um, someone got engaged, someone proposed, someone got married. You may also remember this year as the year someone, a loved one in your family died. I, for me, it's indelible. There are there's, uh, many dates that I can forget, but the one date I never forget, February 21st, 2005. It's there. It's marked in my mind. So we have things that get seared onto our mind that no matter what happens, we don't forget. You know, as I said, that can work in our favor at times. But uh, Moses is kind of telling the same thing to the children of Israel and giving them an opportunity to look back and reflect. And that's what I said. In, in this particular season, it's a good time for us to just stop and really see what God has done for us over the last year. Um, I'm going to jump in and out of Scripture, in the Scripture and then present times. So you'll have to just catch up with me. But as I comb through the Scriptures, passages like Deuteronomy, don't turn there, Deuteronomy 5 and 15, please don't turn there. I'm going to be gone before you get there. Just don't bother. You have to repeat it a few times here for this congregation. But uh, uh, to remember that to the children of Israel that they were servants and how God brought them out with a mighty arm and hand out of the bondage of Egypt. Again, in Deuteronomy 8 and 18, uh, the remember, it's God who gives you the ability to get wealth. In Deuteronomy 15 and 16, remember you were bondmen in Egypt and God redeemed you. So there's this constant... Uh, don't forget. And why? Because the children of Israel forgot. It seems self-evident if you read the passages that talk about their trip through the wilderness way, they forgot. 
and needed constant reminders of diverse uh, things from God. But I looked at the one particular scripture that, you know, I think we've read this many times and maybe passed over its more profound meaning, which occurs in Deuteronomy 8 and uh, beginning at, at uh, verse 2. And it says, Thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness to humble thee, to prove thee, to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. And he humbled thee, suffered thee to hunger, fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man does not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. And there's a fresh reminder here, your clothing didn't, says your raiment, wax not old upon thee, neither did thy foot swell these forty years. Thou shalt also consider in thine heart that as a man chasteneth his son, so the Lord thy God chasteneth thee. And of course, if you kind of read through, it says, for the Lord thy God bringeth thee into a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains and depths that spring out of the valleys and hills, a land of wheat, barley, vines, fig trees, pomegranates, a land of oil, olive, and honey, a land wherein thou shalt eat bread without scarceness. Thou shalt not lack anything in it, a land whose stones are iron, and out of the, whose hills thou mayest dig brass. When thou hast eaten and art full, then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good land which he hath given thee. And a final admonition right here in verse 11. Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God. And, of course, it's in keeping his commandments and judgments, but the children of Israel were really quick to forget just as quickly as they were delivered. And as I began to pick this apart, as I said, at the 11th hour, I kind of sat and I, it was kind of one of those, ah, oh, crumb, you know, <laughs> Why? Why this scripture? And of course, I think God was trying to show me something, and hopefully it will be something for you to reflect on. This word uh, in the Hebrew for remember, and I'll write just the English uh, phonetic, zakar, um, we say remember, but it should really be more like mapping out where you are going, the, the way in which you will go. So it is to recall or to remember, but it's not just of a memory recall. It is more like if you're going to travel somewhere, you get out a map and you map your course. And that way, if you lose your way, you're able to look back at the map. And nowadays, people, I'm sure, don't do that. They have GPS and phones that actually have compasses on them that are electronic compasses. How delightful. In fact, they have apps, special apps now, if you're into the app world. Just point the phone in that direction, and it'll tell you where thou goest. Yes. All right. <laughs> Whither thou go and where you go, who knows? So um, the roadmap of remembering must be, and in this framework, related to God. See, a lot of people want to look back on the past year, for example, and they want to look at themselves. Rather, take just a minute, and hopefully when you leave here, to look back on this last year in relation to your relationship with God and how He led you during the last year. Um, now, I, I know now, uh, early this morning, why I ended up here. Because a lot of a lot of us spend an awful lot of time fighting off the demons of suffering and pain and hurt and anguish. We do it by prayer. We do it by lament. We do it by complaining. We have different methods. Not all work. Not all are effective. And um, it dawned on me that God led the children of Israel. He led them. He delivered them. And this is a lesson that is often forgotten in our lives. When God began to deliver, he had to call Moses. 
And the beginning of that deliverance and the redemption story began far beyond the, the, the present bondage that we may read of later on in the Pentateuch. The deliverance, in fact, began way back there with Abraham and God saying, your people are going to go in. Four generations later, they'll come out richer. So you've always got to look behind something, not just at the immediate cause. But nevertheless, these people were in bondage, in Egypt, in bondage, needed a deliverer. God used Moses to deliver the people. And the most interesting thing is the order in which we find the people and their deliverance, which should be a special note to us today as we look back. Moses is trying to highlight deliverance. Don't forget you were a bondman. Don't, don't forget you were enslaved. Don't forget where you were. He doesn't say, now, keep living like it or keep acting like it or keep talking about it. He just says, don't forget. Remember this. And why? Because God's deliverance begins for the children of Israel. No matter how far you go back, the first deliverance begins with them applying the blood. I'm talking about not the child, Moses as a baby and so forth, as a tangible, visible act of faith, began with applying the blood on the posts, the lentil of each person's house. And this is the way we begin our walk of deliverance. Not, not to be misunderstood, I am not saying that uh, we have the capacity. God enters in, brings a deliverer, which comes to us today through Jesus, but the blood had to be applied on the house where the person lived. And it's the same thing with this tabernacle today. There's no difference. God says, this is, this is the price I paid, the shed blood. It's applied to this earthly tabernacle for me to then keep remaining and abiding. So the deliverance factor, and I kind of chronicled a few of these things. Uh, the first thing that should be remembered is the deliverance out of Egypt. And that that first thing that we, we have to talk about, unfortunately, is what uh, the church world does so well today. The, rather than tell you you're in Egypt's bondage and you need deliverance, it's just a mere glitch. God winks at sin. It's just a mere glitch. It's really not a problem. And, and if you'll work hard enough, you can fix it. And if deliverance from bondage is being taught, this is how it's being taught. Egypt and its bondage, deliverance, excuse my abbreviations, and then we have something remarkable. Through the deliverance, we have the wilderness way, then the promised land. Today's church seems to not want to talk about this, and there is no such thing as bondage or sin, the life of sin. And deliverance, well, you can do it yourself. And once you're delivered, you have a round-trip ticket to fantasy land to go and be a whoopee Christian somewhere and have a darn good time. <laughs> so the way of deliverance and God through Moses is saying, don't forget this because I led you. See, the other thing that's always forgotten as we look back, all of the blunders of the past year, all of our heartaches, all the things that we prayed for, and the things that we maybe didn't pray for or ask for. God was there all along. So when we look back, we can't look back at the experience of our last year without looking back with God in view. Now, if you believe you're a child of God, I'm going to say this, and I'm probably going to make some people very angry, but there is nothing that comes into our life that God doesn't let. And a lesson so profound, I won't get into it now, but out of the book of Job, God opened my eyes to see, wow. You know, Job's wife says, aren't you going to curse God yet after everything's gone? He says, wait a minute, should I accept good at the hand of God and not accept the bad or the unpleasant or the evil? What is this? Are we selectively deciding what is our lot in life? To the child of God, he orders our steps, and those steps may include some big, hard ones to climb. You remember the scripture, he'll not tempt you beyond what you're able? We forget that a lot. I'm sure the children of Israel 
They couldn't be bothered with that. Just get us to where we need to go. It's like the church today. Just get me there. I don't care how you do it, just get me there. I bought two tickets to the promised land by... <laughs> I'm getting in. Thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee. God's leading in the wilderness. Now this, this became quite an interesting revelation to me. And I said, this is why I believe God used this to get my attention. Um, God's leading in the wilderness. If we really believe that God, at whatever time, is my time or yours, I can't bring you into salvation as the church world teaches. We can go and lasso people and bring them into the kingdom. But when God, who does the initiating, wakes up our heart and our mind to hear, to receive, to listen, and we really recognize, each one of us should recognize, we were in Egypt's bondage, that we were delivered, and the deliverance came by his mighty hand. Now, today, for the church world, by his Son, through his word, by the Holy Spirit. But this is our journey, friends. You might say, the promised land, we wrestle, if we're going to talk about faith, to promises obtained, which is the promised land. But our whole life is spent, this is what I call the, the world frame, our whole life here is spent in the wilderness way. And why do I say that? Because if you look at the seven stops that the children of Israel made, and there were seven that are quite marked, I had to note them down to really take and pay attention to God's leading in the wilderness. Their first place, Sukkoth, temporary, temporary residence. So remember, they came out of, they came out of bondage. They entered into the new life and see this, the Red Sea, as I was reading this, I thought, yes, they came from death to life because after the sea closed up, death remained. There was the new life, like we are called from death to life, like Lazarus was called out of the grave. And the seven stops that are made from the perhaps lavish, even if they were slaves, lavish uh, residents they lived in now, temporary housing, zin or sin, which could be low palm tree or clay, Mara, bitter. I mean, I stopped at each one of these and I thought, you know, God has such a great sense of humor. If you really think about it, he delivers these people. He delivers them. He brings a deliverer. He brought them out. He knows what he's doing. I could just quit right now and just tell you, okay, folks, he knows what he's doing. Even if this last year didn't look like it, he knows what he's doing. Okay, you can all go home now. But think about that. If he brought them out, if he delivered them, if he gave them away, the blood on the door, and gave them a deliverer, and brings them into what, what appeared to the natural eye as the most ridiculous deliverance in the world, delivered to a place with no water, or the water is bitter, it tells me that in my wilderness way, I will have bitterness to drink from. I will encounter a place where I thirst and I have bitterness, but the Lord will sweeten the water for me. Each one of these represents my journey. As I look back, forget about my lifetime. If I just look back at this year, there were many bitter moments for me. Personally, personal betrayal, disappointments, things that were extremely humiliating to me, things that I couldn't even begin to comprehend. Why would God do this thing? Why would God hmm, fill in the blanks for yourself? And I really had to look back to realize God gave me some bitter water. Had I not gone to him, I couldn't have partook, but he made it sweet for me and gave me a lesson out of it. And I thought, hmm, what about Elim on the way? I wrote all these down. It says uh, the place of 70, uh, 70, there's 70 palm trees, I think it is. 70 palm trees and 12 wells of water. I know there's got to be some meaning in that, no doubt. They stop there. Rephidim, place of rest. This is all in the wilderness way. 
And for the people who are not schooled and they, they read Rephidim, place of rest, ah, man, they put the feet up and they just kick back. Yeah, it's the first battle. What are you talking about, rest? I thought this place was Rephidim. Yeah, it's the first place where you're going to get the shillelagh kicked out of you if you don't start acting in faith. That's rest. Yeah, that's rest. This one I have a little interesting time pronouncing. Kibrath Hatava, Graves of Lust. You know, if you really think about it, and it's like mind-boggling, these stops along the wilderness way represent our life and the things we grapple with throughout our life. Graves of Lust to the last place, Kadesh, sacred, Barnea, those journeying ways which are marked out for us if we talk about God's leading in the wilderness. Now, you may not feel like your last year was a wilderness. Mine was a jungle. <laughs> it had all kinds of interesting things in it, but God led. And there have been times if I would have just rested on my ability to perhaps try and make a decision on whether to follow what seemed to be the absolute contradiction of reason, well, I opted to go for the one that seemed the most absurd because I'm sure that's the one God would pick. <laughs> After much praying and fasting and asking God, but the Lord's leading for this last year. I believe the Lord led us in many, many ways, both as a church and as an individual. And as I said, we can't always think the Lord's leading is filled with joy. And if you remember, a few weeks ago, I taught the lesson out of 1 Peter. We're walking contradictions, heaviness, manifold heaviness, and joy, greatly rejoicing at the same time. That's why we be a confused people. All right. <laughs> but if you really think about it, what God did while they wandered, and, you know, we don't have these great signs, but I just picture the whole camp being instructed to pick up and move. Now, I have a caricatured version of that, but then I have the real depiction. If you really read how many people were moving, what it took to move the camp. And everywhere that they journeyed, God said, this is the place, set up shop here. There wasn't some, oh, that looks like a good spot over there. Let's go over there. Let's go try that place out for a little while. God said, set up here. And then everything gets set up at that place where God instructs. He sent a uh, pillar of cloud and fire to guide, to shelter from the sun as a sign, the fire by night, everything a symbol of his abiding presence. And if you think about it, these people were given more indicators of where to go and what to do and how to do it, more leading than we'll ever get. But we have a pattern to look back and say, well, the Lord led these murmuring, ungrateful people. I'm not as ungrateful as they are. Surely I don't murmur as much, right? Yeah. <laughs> Get real. <laughs> both hands are up. I didn't, luckily, I didn't ask you because everybody would have had both hands up. But if you begin to look at the book of Numbers and you, you start to map their wanderings, for an untrained eye, you'd say, boy, these people were just darn confused. They went all over the map. Uh-uh. God, this is the way God will do things. If you look back in the last year, I'm sure he did it to you. He did it to me. The wanderings, certainly the ones that are chronicled in Numbers, because Numbers begins a chronicle of almost regression and going backwards, retrogression. God says, no, 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 no mistakes. I'm going to take you back a couple of steps, and i got to take you back in order for you to go forward again. Ah, you didn't learn your lesson yet. I'm going to take you back yet another couple of steps. You ready? Ah, no, sorry, another couple of steps. And so it is with our life. You know, somebody asked me this question this week. Well, how does God deal with our situations individual? And I just, just that. I actually quoted this scripture that God proved the children of Israel. He brought them to humble them and prove them. And of course, probably subliminally, the scripture did not leave my mind, and here we are. 
The wilderness way is part of life. And if people think, well, what? that's pretty cruel of God. Is God capricious? And he just says, well, go, get out there. Read the Chronicle of Jesus in Luke 4. Not now, but in your leisure time. And in Matthew 4, it says, and specifically in Luke 4, that Jesus was filled with the Spirit and then was led out into the wilderness to be tempted of Satan. That's why I look at this, I could make a whole road map of what salvation looks like, and the whole church world would probably say, you're a heretic. It only begins to really get real the minute you've committed your way and you look to God. In the wilderness way is where temptation lives. Oh, you may have had it while you were in Egypt and you enjoyed it and it was good. Who doesn't enjoy it and it's not good? Of course. Do I know any of you? <laughs> Hello. But once you get to the wilderness way, it's not like saying, oh, well, I don't desire these former things. They just start to get further and further away. But the temptation and the tempter, relentless, incipient evil, not just of the tempter, but really what dwells in us. And you say, well, how can you say that? Real easily. A twofold thing. Let me read you a scripture. You stay in Deuteronomy. I'm going to read you a scripture out of 2 Timothy. Not long enough to do anything with it except just read it. It says here, 2 Timothy 3 and verse 12, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Wow, count me in. I want to be a Christian. <laughs> but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And of course, he goes on to say, this is instructions to Timothy, that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. And then the scripture which I've often quoted, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, is profitable for doctrine, for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction. Literally, that's the same Greek word, the paideia, the training, instruction, in righteousness. So, if somebody's going to ask all the things that fell on you this year that weren't good in the world's eyes, God probably was using them. That's his technique, by the way. I'm, just, I'm a little hard-headed, but it's finally dawning on me. That's God's technique to use the things that we really don't want to deal with, don't want to acknowledge, hate to even say it happened. God uses those things in our leading God also provides through the wilderness way. God provided water when there wasn't any. God provided food, manna, mmm, manna, until, oh, we don't want this food anymore. You know, oh, we're hungry. What are we going to do? Bring us out here to die of starvation? Oh, we don't want this food anymore. We've had enough of the bread of God. Wow, I could do something with that because that's sometimes how I feel the church world treats me. We don't want any more bread. Give us the, I don't know, sausage or uh, <laughs> cookies or something. And no more manna. Pastor Scott, stop with the manna already. I said, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. No more bread. We hate bread. But God's provision in the wilderness. Do you realize if you read this aright, Moses reminds them, uh, he suffered them to hunger, fed them with manna, and then goes on to say, you, you, your clothes, you were taken care of no matter what. You were taken care of. Uh, please, look back with me, because that's the one thing I really thought as I was reading this late last night, and my eyelids could barely stay open. They were like so heavy as I was just... <laughs> in the word like this, and you know when your eyes kind of look like saucers? And <laughs> giving you the blow by blow here of what happened and how it happened, TMI. But provision that was made for us during the last year. You know, I have people travel with me, and some people get a little upset because when they travel with me, 
I like to pray before I eat. And I don't do it for the reasons that most people do. When I pray, I'm really, I'm just grateful that I have a meal on my table. And if I sit alone, I still pray and give thanks to God that I have food that's going to go in my belly. I'm not sure what type of food it's going to be, but it's going to nourish me. Even if it's not the best of food, like not the best quality food, God will make it good and nutritious in my belly. Now, please don't take that as a cop-out. Some of you ex-diet people will say, ah, see, work for her. <laughs> but it's why I like to pray, not because I want to have this uh, long, uh, everybody now bow your heads. We're going to pray for everybody. And the food may be at the very end. No, I pray because I'm really just, I have a spirit of gratitude. God has given me food to eat, a roof over my head. That's all I can say is thank you. And you know, if you look at your situation, look back at the last year, the Lord provided for you. Last time I checked here, I'm looking, everybody seems to be wearing clothes. <laughs> thank God. <laughs> and bread and water. Do you know that's the greatest thing throughout this whole book? The anxiety to either not have in God's people, the anxiety that there may be a lack, like the widow that didn't know where she was going to get the food from, the anxiety of lack, or the anxiety to quest after the mammon. And usually there's nothing in the middle. So God's provisions, he provided. Now, interestingly enough, um, there's a reason for all this, and there's a reason for this message as we look back. There are three things I would like you to highlight. You can draw circles around them. You can do push-ups around them later on. But there's a reason, and I want to tell you what the reason is, what the important thing is here. Three things that are being said. The first one in this passage is brought through the wilderness to humble. I'm going to put us, to humble us to prove us. And the last one is kind of a little bit longer, so I'll have to fill in the blanks as I go. But let's start with number one, to humble us. And this is the toughest thing, no matter if you've been in this church for 30 years or not, it's the toughest thing to get across. We've quoted Tozer saying, a truly humble man doesn't look back to see if he was. He just was. He doesn't go around asking people if he was. He just was. And the toughest thing we will war against as Christians, it's a very bitter pill to swallow, that sometimes things are brought into our lives to humiliate us. Now, there'll be people around you, people that are not your friends and not your family, and they'll say, well, what kind of a God would humiliate? The same God that knows that the fall of Satan, as described in the book of Isaiah, talks about how Satan, Lucifer, was high and lifted up and so centered in himself. He said, I will ascend to the throne. I will. I, me, me, I. So I think God knows a little bit about what dwells in each of us. In fact, a careful reading of the book of Job, it dawned on me. There's a, I have a lot of people around me that are like Job's friends, you know. I just honestly, they think they're theologians, but... You know, listen, you just got to leave certain things, leave well enough alone, right? But what is pointed out by Elihu, one of Job's last people to come in contact with him, is that there was some pride in Job. He was a righteous man, he was a good man, but there was still some pride in him that God wanted to break and purge him of. Now, we can say we hear the word and we want to be obedient to the word, but sometimes God is going to use these things in the wilderness way to humble us. Look at the last year. Please don't raise your hand. Just look in your heart. And over the course of the last year, there will have been things that occurred as you went that were somewhat, if not completely designed, to hit you right at the knees. You ever had anybody, you ever had a doctor test your reflexes? You know what that looks like? Right? It's kind of like that. God will let things. That's why I said there's nothing that comes into our life. I'm convinced of it. 
that God will not use those very things as teaching tools. Sometimes it's to bring us and knock us down a few pegs because we've gotten so high in our walk, we're just floating on clouds to humble us. And there's only one way that we become humble. It is not by trying to act or trying to emulate. It's by those most humiliating experiences of life. I was ministering to a man this week and asked him what he really wanted to be. Why did he come to listen to me speak? And what he really wanted to be in life. And, And he just said, I want to be more humble. I'd like to be more humble. And I kept thinking to myself, well, be careful what you wish for. <laughs> hey, if you really want that, God will oblige. And believe me, afterwards you're going to be saying, Uncle, I had enough. Thank you. But that's the way God does it. These things that we would like to uh, not deal with. You know, one of the books I don't teach out of a lot, which is Proverbs, there's tons of things in Proverbs telling us about pride. And pride is directly related to the humbling experience because until we have been humiliated, until we have been brought to a humiliating experience, the pride, even if it's as small as a small grain of salt, still remains. And as long as pride remains in a person, listen, this isn't the lesson like, okay, let's all empty out the pride today. That's not going to happen. God will do that for each one of us in his perfect time. Believe me. Can I smile again any larger? You know, do you remember, cheer up, saints, it's going to get worse? Well, cheer up, saints, it's going to get worse and better, but worse. The humbling experience, if you look back at the past year, may have been something you really didn't want to have happen. I have one or two people in mind that are not local, and I won't mention their names, but one particular family, they were a successful family. They ended up losing their home this year because of the nature of how things have shifted in the country. And one of the most humiliating experiences for them was having to deal with their children. That was very humiliating. Somebody took them in to their house And the house next door became available, and somehow they managed to get a loan and get the house. Now they are approved for this house. But they had to go through that experience to know. there was It happened for some reason. We can say we're we're God's children. If I really believe I'm a child of God, then there are things that are going to happen. And whether God brings them, or like Job, have you considered... With Satan, have you considered my servant Job? Have you put your name in there and fill in the blank? But nothing will come that God is not wanting to teach a lesson. Which brings me to my next point. These people had to go through the the humiliation with their children. And the flip side is they saw God's goodness to provide, God's care and his love that someone would take them in and then right away the house next door became available. They now are living in a house They have a roof over their head. They had to go through that. I don't know why. When people ask the question, well, why does God allow such things? Maybe we ought to stop and say, why are we asking what God is doing instead of just leaning on him, even though that's the natural thing to say, "Uh, uh, uh." God, I know I'm in your care. I know everything that you bring into my life, you do nothing Like you said about Job, just don't lay a hand on him to Satan. There isn't anything that you're going to let come upon me that's designed to destroy me. Having said that, to prove us. This just happens to be one of my favorite things because as I read the scripture, it's a study I've studied on for probably the last year or two. I used to think that God's proving was limited to see what was in the heart of man, whether he would do... Do you remember we did a lesson on Pirasmos? We did, a, we did a lesson with a handout. The lesson from this, and by the way, this word here for prove is in the Greek would be Pirasmos. Um, the lesson here for God proving us is 
not so much for God to see what's in our hearts. If God is sovereign and omnipotent, he knows the junk that's in this container. And some of the junk that I think he doesn't know about, he knows all about. But I think more importantly, when God proves us, as he did with the children of Israel, I think he's doing something for us that we fail to see, and I pray you'll receive this in the spirit it's meant. A lot of the proving that we go through is not so that we can, our heart can be revealed to God, so much so as God can reveal our hearts to us. Let me say that again, because that's a lesson that was a hard pill for me to swallow, but when I grasped it, you know, listen, God, let's go to Abraham for a minute. In Genesis 22, in verse 1, where Abraham is going to offer Isaac, and it says in that passage that God tempted, same word, God tempted Abraham to see if he would offer his son, his only begotten son. Do you think God, who knows the heart and the mind of man, didn't know? Now, please don't engage in the free will conversation. I don't want you to get lost in the fray and that's Satan's design, so we can go off here and decide, well, he had a free will, and he, he could do it, he couldn't do it. God wanted to see what Abraham would do, but the flip side is he wanted to show Abraham. The lesson is when God proves us, it's not to see necessarily and completely what's in our heart, but to reveal our heart to us. And let me give you an example in the now, because this has happened to me so often I finally just threw up my hands and said, I quit fighting against this. How many of you have ever read a scripture and you either thought the scripture is for somebody else, but it's not for you? Come on, be honest. You're in church. Thank you. <laughs> and then you go back and read it again and you say, this is difficult. How can this be? Like the scripture that says we're to love one another. But you know, maybe that reveals, my, my issue with grappling with that is maybe God, by the Holy Spirit, is convicting me of, of hate that I have in my heart. John, 1 John says, if you hate your brother, don't say you're a child of God if you hate your brother and love's not in you. So how do I get my mind around this? This is the way if we live and feed on this word, eventually, not some brother or sister over there coming with, a, with this Proverbs club over our head, but as we meditate in the scripture, God reveals us to us by his word. He shows us that we're frail. He shows us that we're broken. Sometimes, as I refer to that incipient evil, that on the surface, you know, you see somebody, I've heard this expression, if I hear it one more time, <laughs> that person is a strong Christian. You mean like they lift weights? <laughs> Popeye was supposedly strong, too. <laughs> we have this verbiage that I, I really don't know. People who use that, they must not be reading the scripture because when I started off, I thought I was strong, but the more I go, the more I recognize I'm weak and I'm pretty ugly inside. And, and that's not to be self-abasing. That's because each time I read the scripture, it's like God, the Holy Spirit, lifts up this mirror while I'm reading and says, take a look at yourself. And some of the most tender moments I've had in the scripture have been reading those difficult passages that you just, you just assume they're somebody else's problem. Let somebody else deal with them, right? Those are the ones you need to go back and reread because that's God proving your heart. Believe me, Jesus said he didn't commit himself to some of the people because he knew what was in the heart of men. You remember that scripture? Well, then I think that if Jesus came in the flesh but was all God and all man knowing these things? Did he need to prove to test when he said, well, where can we buy bread? And the scripture says he said these things to prove, to see what was in the heart. Philip, these disciples, would they trust God? We don't have uh, so much money, though. It was to reveal their own unbelief. Man, this, is, this may be the most important lesson for us as the last Sunday, but for a lifetime. Instead of, listen, God's not asking us to try and act and be perfect and uh, put on the airs. He just says, if you'll abide in my word, and when that word becomes real to you, quits being letters and ink on paper and becomes flesh and blood, I don't need someone to come and tell me I'm not okay or I'm basically okay. What? This word, by his spirit, brings the conviction to prove me and to show me. 
And likewise to you. And this is what he did to the children of Israel. Why do I say that? Because can you imagine the humiliation of the children of Israel? They were in Egypt. They knew what bread was. They saw it made. When the water came up on the Nile, where there was an abundance for the ability to make papri and food, they saw it. They tasted that good food. So now, now that God has led them, and they forgot this, that God led them, we forget that God is leading us. God says, I want you, basically, he caused them to hunger, it says. Why do you think? They could have gone on a starvation program and said, we protest, we protest. Good, die. <laughs> but he caused them to hunger so that they would have to turn to him. Lord, feed me. And that's what he wants from us, that these experiences, the children of Israel, are a lesson for us that as we look back, some of our humiliation experiences were designed to bring us to the knowledge he is the one who provides. You know that loaf of bread when you go buy it at the store? You say, well, how is God's hand in, uh, what's the sliced white sliced bread? Give me a name of it. Wonder Bread. <laughs> we got a lot of white bread eaters here. <laughs> Believe me, when you go and buy that Wonder Bread, and you get it off the shelf, and it's in its plastic container with its bright colors, and <laughs> sandwiches, and all kinds of good things that you can envision, feeding the birds, or whatever you do with bread, that if you can't see God's hand in that, that go back to where that was made, and if you keep going back far enough, God's hand was in it because the flour that it took to make that bread was in a field somewhere as God brought the earth and the sun and the rain and as these golden uh, pictures of wheat are going across the skyline somewhere, that was God before it ever became mass produced and mass processed and mass whatever else you want to call it. That was God's plan back there. It was still His provision and it still is His provision. We forget that. Just a simple thing like bread and water, God said He provided. So, to humble them, to prove them, and one last thing, which is maybe another important lesson, and it's right here. He says in verse 3, that he might make thee to know the possibility, that he might make thee to know that man does not live by bread only, but by every word, every rima, from the Greek, if we we're reading the Septuagint, that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. So let me say this to you. Maybe this year your prosperity, your greatest prosperity, was in your adversity because it is in our adversity. In the night, while we're crying, while we're praying, while we think we're alone, we usually turn to Him, even if it's something as short as, help me, Lord. Your greatest prosperity for this last year will most likely be your adversity. That he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word, every rima that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. Now, let me, let me make a big leap here. In Matthew's Gospel, when Jesus is led out into the wilderness and tempted by Satan, Jesus, our Lord, uses this very scripture as Satan, as the tempter, as the deceiver, says to him, turn these stones into bread. Only because it was 40 days and Jesus hungered, but I want you to hear something so subtle. Why didn't he say, turn these stones into apples? 
turn these stones into bananas. That's nutritious. Turn these stones into chocolate bars. OK. <laughs> Little temptation now and then. It's OK. Yeah. Turn these stones into bread. Do you notice Satan is so crafty? He'll use the very thing that represents God, his word, his essence, and our sustenance to mess with your mind. And Jesus' retort and rebuke is with a rima, that word of God that he wields. One of the king's houses, very sweet, uh, gave me a, a dagger, a short dagger, and they had engraved on it rima. And that blessed me when I opened it because I thought, ha ha. Yeah, pastor's going to come at you with the Rima now. <laughs> but Jesus says this very thing to Satan and gives us a pattern. Temptation of various kinds will come. But hear me out. It is in the Rimas, in the bread of life, that we find our deliverance, our weapons to combat and overcome. So... You know, in the big scheme of things, uh, this may look a little aggressive here, to humble, to prove that we may know that man doesn't live by bread alone. In fact, I'd take it a step further. Our concept of understanding God's humbling process, his proving process, should bring us to an awareness. We can't do it by ourselves. We need help. And the moment, this is the beauty of this lesson, the moment you stop for a minute and you look back at this last year, you're going to see something quite remarkable. You're all sitting in front of me and you made it here. That's the most remarkable thing. Yeah. Not, that doesn't, by the way, that doesn't take faith. That's just a factual statement. That doesn't take faith. Faith says we made it through next year, which hasn't happened yet. Ha. Huh. Just don't get too excited on me just yet. <laughs> but the concept that's being put out as plain as day, you can't escape it. You can stand and look at yourself from now to the last year, what's behind you, and you can think, I, I did okay, it wasn't all that bad. Or you can look at it in relation to God. And if you're looking back in relation to God, you're going to see something change the uh, structure a little bit, you will remember the roadmap. I started out at Zakar. That is the roadmap. The mapping out, the way. Jesus was called the way. The roadmap, which God led thee these 360-some days that have just passed. In the wilderness of the world, some of us call home in Los Angeles or wherever you may be to humble you. God's not a sadist, but just reflect on some of the things that have happened. This is how God is going to do the cleansing for us. And it doesn't happen in one fell swoop, little bit by little bit. And you'll look back, and 10 years from now, and this is the voice, and some of you are the voice of experience here, the things you thought you could never fathom, you'll say, God, well, God brought me through, and that was a piece of cake. I don't know about this next one, though. That looks pretty tough. You'll remember all the ways that to humble us, to prove us, that we may better know ourselves. That when the next time you hear somebody say, well, I, you know, I'm a good person, recognize they don't probably know themselves too well. Because that's the utterance of a person who only lives at the surface. And believe me, what lies beneath the surface, God made it. God's not, there's nothing in you or in me that God's going to fall off his throne over. But he knows the nature and the frame. We just like to make our, our dust look a little bit more gold-like. Right, God? It's gold, isn't it? To know what's in our heart. And believe me, this is where the rubber meets the road. A lot of people can open the mouth with Christian platitudes, but it's here in your adversity of the last year, and maybe it's even today, 
you'll find yourself prosperous, not because you have the tangible in your hands, because you're feeding on the bread of life, our sustenance. Now, I hope as we reflect as a congregation, we'll not only see all the yucky stuff, but we'll look back and we'll also say, the Lord was good and merciful to us this past year. The things that could have happened didn't. God spared us. Don't forget that hedge of protection. Some people say, well, God must have lifted the hedge. Well, if he did, you're in the right place because it's he that would lift it. It's his hedge. It's he that will lift it. And think of this as a dear, beloved child of God. Do you really think he wants harm and detriment to come to you? No, he wants the best for his children. Sometimes the best comes in the form of adversity. That's when we begin to prosper as people of God, taking his word, his bread, and wielding the rima against those things that come against us because we are more than conquerors. Now, please just take a minute before we stand up and do anything, just take a minute to let these words kind of sink into your heart that no matter what you've been through and no matter where you are today, God already knows about it. He sees your tears. He sees the lines on the forehead when the eyebrows get furled. He sees the wife looking on the husband in the hospital bed and sees the mama crying for her baby. Now, I'm going to tell you something. So I started this way. God is still on his throne. And what didn't look like is because he is. He's led us. Now let's look forward and look ahead to a better year filled with more trials, more proving, more humbling. Oh boy, I'm excited. <laughs> and know that we as children of God look to our heavenly Father. He hears our prayers. He loves us. His care Underneath bottomless, that message you know too well, his care for us. Just let that settle in no matter where you are and what you're going through. He's led you this far. He's not going to leave you to go the rest of the way alone. So look ahead now and know he'll be with you. That's my message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.